Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 33 of Interstellar Quest, and we begin with Jebediah Kerman once more in his nuclear aircraft, setting speed records, flying off to a, a mythical place called the Badlands. He's able to exceed Mach 4. In fact, on his descent to the area in question, he exceeds Mach 4.1 or 1250 meters per second. I had no idea this thing could go so fast. But upon landing, he gets out and he does all his usual science reports. There is much to be learned in this oft-forgotten corner of Kerbin. Using the array of scientific inf instrumentation he has brought with him. Now, a number of these parts are from B9 Aerospace, and this has not yet been updated for KSP.23. I've had a couple of requests how to get everything working in uh, 0.23 and obviously you start with the existing B9 release which is for 0.22 then if you go into the uh, thread, the discussion thread, there is someone has posted a link to an updated Exurgent Engineering DLL, you need to replace that and uh, then you now to, need to go and download Fire Spitter which contains a bunch of uh, cockpit configurations and finally there's also an optional configuration file change which adds the experiment functionality the ability to take stuff out of the experiments and store it in the capsule but anyway Jebediah finds one of my favorite science messages on the planet Kerbin the grass here is definitely not as green as it is in other places but the knowledge that you've been at a place called the Badlands makes you feel cool and Jebediah is cool Anyway, having carried out an aircraft mission, it's time to see what the rocket division is up to. Yes, Jebediah, Bill and Bob are testing a hypothetical launch escape system designed to carry a capsule clear from a distressed rocket somehow. This uses a pile of solid rocket motors and should accelerate at about 10 G under ideal circumstances. Clearly, that was not ideal circumstances. Some engineering or re-engineering may be required. Now, the idea behind a launch escape system, if you don't know, is to carry a space capsule containing crew free from a booster below it. Now, if you imagine a vehicle during a launch situation, you have the rockets pushing up against the capsule and uh, you have to pull it away faster than the rockets do and possibly faster than an exploding stack of rockets when things go fast. Now another requirement is that you probably want to turn it sideways. So uh, this is what I'm doing is I'm adding a single extra um, a single extra sepatron there angled slightly so as to turn the capsule gracefully off to the side and uh, make it depart from the path of the rocket beneath it. That didn't quite go as planned, did it? Oh, damn! Oh, wow. I have no idea how they survived that. It must be Jebediah. Either that or I have cheats enabled. Um, that would not be good. <laughs> Nope, no cheats enabled here. That was a, a that was a proper landing. Uh, everything broke off it, but that was a successful test. Other than that, okay, let's try that again with a slightly repositioned Sepatron. Go, and the whole thing spins. Quick parachute! Oh wow! I swear that is hitting the ground even faster. But here uh, they are surviving. That's the good old crew. Those are pros. They're, they are able to put up with anything. Okay, another slight repositioning of that uh, motor so that we switch off to the side. Oh, that looks... No, that's not it. I thought it was a little more graceful and parachute partially deployed. I cannot believe they're surviving this. These these crew, there's a reason that these guys are the original three. They are tough as nails. They survive anything. Okay, test number 437. We have readjusted the location. Oh! That was not supposed to happen. Now we're spinning like crazy. That is not the way we want to go. <laughs> if the rocket... 
if this happened in a real one, the rocket would like chase up behind us and splat us. I mean, launch escape towers, they're designed to fire at about... Apparently, the one time a, a, an escape tower was actually used in an emergency, it accelerated the crew at about 14 to 17 Gs away from a, a, a pad fire, basically, before the rocket exploded. And reputedly, the crew turned off the voice recorders afterwards so they could swear and not be on the record. Yes, once more for science and the safety of the crew. Go! I say safety of the crew, but it's mostly about science and building things that do crazy stuff. Okay, um, that again, once again, probably is not deviating. I can't seem to get it to turn over. It either spins or it turns over too much. Uh, uh, let's ditch this and hope that it uh, doesn't kill us on the way down. So yeah, this it was the Soyuz... T-10, right, which was a spacecraft that was supposed to be taking crew to the Salyut station, and basically there was a launch pad fire. Uh, what happened... I, something happened, basically, there was a fire on the rocket, and as things started to get out of control, the launch team, you know, triggered it, except that by that point the cables had burned through. Oh my god, what happened there? Oh, wow, this is disastrous. Um... And the crew also tried to activate it. It didn't happen. But uh, apparently they were able to activate it by radio. And then, of course, it shot off. The crew were not... They were, were, you know, the crew had tried it and it hadn't worked. Yeah, then it shot off like 14 to 17 G. <laughs> uh, everything worked. Parachute landed. And yeah, it was um, Vladimir Titov. And uh, I can't remember who it was. But Titov supposedly... He, he reported that he turned off the voice recorder because of swearing. <laughs> Go and check it out on Wikipedia. Only time an escape system has been used. Okay, finally. Let's just hope this works. We're going to fire this. Oh, that didn't work so well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it turned sideways. That is what I wanted. We had the main engines firing there as well. Obviously simulating an accident on the pad or something. That is exactly what we want to have happen. We want everything to fly off, turn sideways, and the capsule flies a... S I love the fireworks coming off of this thing. Okay. So now, testing it under acceleration conditions. Oh, beautiful. Carries itself clear from the rocket. And the rocket is going to fly past us and hopefully won't hit. Yeah, look at that. Beautiful. Pasta's pretty close, though. <laughs> I probably should uh, probably should avoid that happening in the future. Well, now we've got to use it on something. Oh, actually, no, I didn't end up using it. I, <laughs> instead, I decided, why not try building a crew ferry vehicle using the rapier engines, right? The rapier engines are mixed-mode engines, and... We, they will operate as jet engines. Now this is designed to carry three crew up to the space stations so we can perform like you know, life support, we can supply them with life support, we can supply them with crew, we can do all those other things that don't need us to build a whole rocket. And so one of the things you can't see here is that there is a bunch of parachutes in that staging section. So. Once we get it up into a suborbital trajectory, we're going to drop that stage and have it return to the planet Kerbin, fold out the gear beforehand, trigger the parachutes, and hopefully the whole thing will gracefully land on the surface and be recovered. Meanwhile, the spacecraft continues into orbit and uh, it will do its thing and it too will return safely to the Kerbin surface, uh, although it will ditch those fuel tanks. The idea is... We didn't want the complexity of trying to figure out all those aerodynamic equations on a space plane. So we thought, why not build a rocket with parachutes and return that and you make that the return stage? Since uh, landing space planes on the runway is actually really... It can take a really, really long time with the rapiers because you end up having to fly a long way a lot of the time. Anyway, how are we going to do here? We're going to fold out those solar panels and we're going to make an injection maneuver, bring our periaps up to about 50 kilometers. There we go. 
And now, there we go, 48, that's good. And now we can, what we can do is activate the parachutes so that when it re-enters the atmosphere, that's the parachutes being activated. And then uh, once we've done that, we'll fold out the landing gear. So this is it configured for re-entry and landing. And in theory, if we detach it, it'll fall through the atmosphere, passively stable because of the mass of those engines. And, of course, land safely because of the parachutes. It's a brilliant plan. I don't know what could go wrong with that. Uh, it's also unmanned, so if something does go wrong, we don't actually care so much, although it will be a little embarrassing for my reputation. So let's watch this magnificent piece of engineering return as I designed it. Well, the, the big question is, will it actually survive re-entry? And will those parachutes survive re-entry? Because they are exposed to a certain extent, and we've had problems with parachutes that are exposed. I had thought of attaching a probe body onto the bottom of the rocket there so that we could, uh, you know, trigger the parachutes later, but... Oh yeah, the parachutes never actually deployed. You know that um, real parachutes mod? Apparently it changes that whole thing about the way parachutes deploy, so this thing just fell like a rock. Not good. Not good, not a single piece left, but I think we know who to blame. It is the real parachutes mod, which uh, has been also responsible for high speed impacts. Anyway, back in orbit, Jebediah and crew have to do the good old uh, maneuver node dance so that they can get into a close encounter with that uh, space station and basically put themselves into a docking pattern. And of course, this is no problem for someone as skilled as Jebediah, someone who can really make this thing fly, someone who can make it maneuver. Uh, also, they find a familiar friend floating nearby. That was one of the first satellites that was launched using that uh, first generation, the first generation Zardoz space plane. Remember uh, Jebediah's test flight of that? Yep. It's still floating around the Earth. Uh, sorry, floating around Kerbin. The Earth, of course, I'm referring to the the dirt on the ground. Is another name is Earth. Yes, we don't call it the Kerbin, right? You don't grow plants in Kerbin. You grow it on Earth, in Earth on Kerbin. Okay, that's a lame excuse. I keep on saying Earth instead of Kerbin. It just happens. It's very hard to fly around something and not call it Earth every now and then. Yeah. Now, you know, of course, Jebediah never makes that mistake. He uh, always, he never speaks at all, in fact. He, Jebediah just looks and he does. He's kind of this, like, you know, genius. He doesn't speak much. Things just happen. And uh, everybody appreciates his awesome flying. There is the space station. We're now going on for a close encounter here. And uh, as we come in, this is when I am time accelerating and the game pauses. And I realize, oh... We're going a little fast. We might swing by this. So, braking engines on, we're doing our best to slow down from about 50 meters per second. But even then, even with a full engine burn and these nice five-point RCS thruster blocks, we are still fly past, you know, 500 meters or so. Yeah, a little too eager to get there. But a good thing is we still remain close enough. We don't unload the model or anything, and we can get back relatively quickly. Only thing is we're going to be docking from the, the sun side, from the docking looking into the sun. So uh, Jebediah will, in fact, have to wear his shades. There we go. Space Lab 1 coming in fast, and soon we will be docking there. Actually, it worked out pretty well because the docking uh, docking node that we added on our previous journey happens to be at this end of the station. That is rather convenient, isn't it? Oh, you know, the last time uh, the last time we were docked to this, the last person to be docked to this was a, a ship flown by Jebediah. The last person, the last ship flown, <laughs> the last ship that was docked to this was also flown by Jebediah. Who'd have thunk it? Okay, so that's us. We're delivering some stuff to the station. And, well, Jebediah and crew are going to stay on orbit for a little while while uh, the existing crew get rotated out to return to Kerbin. I thought that we've spent too much time in space. These guys need to go home. We also need to see if we can take that shuttle and make it work for the higher orbit that is for the 
uh, the power station. The power station has a couple of crew on board, but we don't really need them to be there most of the time. We only need them to be there when we're doing, you know, nuclear fueling or things like that. So I need to somehow come up with a mostly reusable spacecraft for moving crew back and forth from orbit, something that can get all the way up to a 200, a 300 plus kilometer orbit. But yes, yeah, space station is resupplied. Crew is going to head over to their capsule. They just have to move things over and get in there. Come on. There you go. Grab. Get in. Get in. Nope. 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 Get in. Yes. Okay. Everyone's on board and we are ready to head home. After many, many weeks, weeks and months in space even, these guys, they are testing this spacecraft for the first time because if you remember... We did not, in fact, test this spacecraft. So for all we know, it could be that the mass of that fuel in the nose causes it to become aerodynamically unstable, shifts the center of mass, flips it nose first, and everyone dies. Um, hazard of the job. Hazard of the job. Um, we could probably fill it. We could probably empty it out or something. Let's uh, take a, a one last look at the station. I have to say, it does look rather beautiful from, from this angle with the... The blue, and, or sorry, the red and the green lights and the, the blue solar panels, Kerbin spinning below us, everything moving gracefully, of course, belying the fact that we are, in fact, moving it a couple of kilometers per second. It's just so, you know, so mind-blowing. There's a spacecraft, you can see it. If you remember, we launched this in a single vehicle. So that was, this was in the early days before we'd really invented fairings. When uh, the aerodynamics were... For, well, two-meter fairings were not something we'd actually invented just yet. So we had to come up with a, a hack to get the whole thing into orbit without making it look horrible. So yeah, we want to land on the daytime and we want to aim for that continent so pretty much we're going to start burning now we could try and aim for Kerbal Space Center but that continent is the most reliable because we know it's nice and long and you don't tend to miss much of your you don't tend to go in the water here uh, I'd like to land on land because I don't know I just think landing on land is nice because they can get out and they can get back in and they don't have to worry Let's say farewell to the space lab. And we have a long way to go. This will burn very, very quickly. Four times time acceleration, of course, because this is being pushed down using those wimpy little reaction control system thrusters, generating a tiny, tiny fraction of a G. But, uh, you know, they're very small and very convenient, and they... They were the only option because if you remember at the time, I couldn't fit anything in line that would uh, make a convenient sized spacecraft. So we're just going to jettison that. That will fall back into the atmosphere, no doubt, and also uh, make a nice little uh, crater on the surface. What is this one? Uh, it's going to try and orient it that set itself the correct way. We don't have a heat shield on this. There is an extra heat shield which you can add that gives it more endurance into the atmosphere but this is without it because we're coming in at a rather you know sedate pace if we're returning from interplanetary space we definitely want the larger heat shield but this one will be just fine also notice we have no food left so the Kerbals do in fact want to get home as quickly as possible this is a major disaster they do not want to loiter in space when they're all hungry uh, in fact, they also don't want to have this thing rotating. Something is making this spacecraft rotate. I'm not sure what it is, but something in aerodynamics does not like this. And uh, the crew are unfortunately not very happy. <laughs> I have no idea why that is happening. I'm thinking that maybe the parachutes are slightly at an angle and because they're slightly at an angle and we're using you know rocket style symmetry that would put them at the same angle on both sides so it's possible that's what's going on i'm more concerned about the fact that the rockets show that they were heating up or no, the parachutes show that they were heating up but now now they're cooling down Yay, so uh, this spacecraft appears to be aerodynamically stable. Let's uh, dump the monopropellant just in case. 
we uh, we don't need it anymore. We certainly don't need it for stability purposes. We don't need it for navigation purposes. And uh, we prefer to have the least amount of mass touching down because touching down at speed is always going to be uh, kind of potentially hazardous for the Kerbals sitting on their backs. So we are very close. Uh, there's a couple of windows that we have to check. We're very close to uh, our second flyby of Moho. We're also very close to our orbital trim maneuver for our uh, for the Sun Diver. Uh, that's what's going to happen in the next episode. These guys are going to get back to the surface, hopefully, and <laughs> hopefully they won't hit the ground too fast. Because as we've seen, real parachutes or real chute has gone and changed the rules somewhat. There go the parachutes deploying gently, and well, oh, we're still spinning. <laughs> Will, will it slow us down enough? Parachutes deploying nice and slowly at a reasonable altitude. Just, and we're down to about 12, 14 meters per second. 13. Oh, wow. Yes. In future episodes, I clearly need to fit the spacecraft with more parachutes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>